So, we finally determined that intelligence isn't the factor that we think is usable, and that all the other factors that we've put forth are arbitrary. What do you think is a functional factor to weigh more, uh, intrinsic moral importance, Sonny, in your opinion? Yeah, it seems to me, and I think to you, uh, based on Singer's and Bentham's arguments, mm -hmm. that the ability to suffer is a way more compelling factor, I guess, uh, aspect of living or beings that should determine equal consideration. Like, in short, if a being is able to suffer, then they are worthy of equal moral consideration. Right. And some of the uh, argumentation behind this is if a being can't have interests to begin with because unless they are able to suffer, right? To feel pleasure and pain, uh, pleasure and pain, pleasure and pain, right? So <laughs> if I grab my, my calculator <laughs> <laughs> that I have beside my desk, like it's not possible for me to mistreat my calculator because it's not able to suffer, and thus it can't have interest, right? Right. And like the example that was given in the papers, like, uh, like a rock that you kick down the road as you're walking doesn't have an interest in, in not being kicked because it, can't, it doesn't have any suffering. Like, it can't have interest. Exactly. But like, but a mouse, on the other hand, does feel pain when you kick it. So it would have an interest in not being kicked. So then what you're saying is instead of intelligence, sentience, because we would argue that sentience is necessary for you to have a capacity of feeling pleasure and pain, um, is the requirement that we should be basing this off of. And when I say sentience, a definition, loose definition, obviously, would be, like I said, that capacity to experience pleasure and pain, but as well as having hopes for the future. And when I say hopes for the future, that could be Alexander Jimfin, who's seven years old sitting in his room, <laughs> who has <laughs> dreams of becoming the first doctor to do blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I, I'm sorry. I'm working off the cuff here. Um, but discover something super crazy. And... Um, oh, crap. I completely lost where I was. Why was I talking about Alexander Jimothan? <clears throat> okay, yeah. I think I know where you're going. Go ahead. So, like, interest could it include something as complex as, like, Alexander Jimothy wanting to discover the next mitochondria yes right? yes correct but it could also include something as simple as like a cow wanting to graze in peace and just like wanting to eat grass you know exactly so when we take those into consideration it makes sense that we could not hold ourselves as humans with a higher moral importance than the cows that we're killing to eat or the chickens or the etc etc so is there anything else you want to add uh no we do want to like make a clarification here right and that is that we're not this is not creating a new hierarchy it's not saying like beings that suffer are superior to beings that do not suffer and uh, i'll let you get into why that is so <clears throat> according to singer the stipulation is that while both beings that suffer and beings that do not suffer have well-being we cannot focus on just the beings that suffer we need to focus on giving equal weight to the well-being of anything with welfare. 
but only sentience have well-being. So at the end, Singer clarifies that the necessity is a necessity of sentience and that while better than intelligence, this is still a self-interested theory of well-being because we are, to our knowledge at least, because of a communication barrier, the only species on the planet that is considered quote-unquote sentient, to our level at least. So there's still issues with sentience, but at least in my opinion, and I won't speak for you, Sonny, I think it does improve upon the intelligence where intelligence falters. Yeah. And some of the problems, or one of the problems might be, uh, like there could be uh, examples of animals that arguably are not sentient like we were talking about last time like clams oysters they arguably might not be sentient might not even feel pain but i think i would require a lot more scientific expertise than i have to to talk about that without like pulling stuff out like out of thin air you know so yeah I'm down to leave it at that. Okay, and that's fine. Um, I also don't have the knowledge to defend clams and mussels with my whole heart. But moving on, um, with our discussion wrapping up on the fact that this is not a new form of hierarchy, we need to really talk about the implications and what adopting an equal or even just a minimal principle of consideration would do to your life and those are not the same thing so i'm going to start off with the principle of equal consideration it is as wrong to inflict harms on non-human animals as it is to grant oh gosh i almost had a stroke <laughs> that was hard <laughs> um <laughs> The principle of equal consideration says that it's as wrong to inflict harms on non-human animals as it is to inflict those harms on human animals. Sentience is a necessary and sufficient condition for well-being under the principle of equal consideration. So with that in mind, before we talk about the principle of minimal consideration, I have a question for you, Sonny. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to interrupt this program for a quick intermission. Welcome to the debate hour. Um, let's say hypothetically, you have a lifeboat of a hundred chimps versus a lifeboat of one severely intellectually disabled human being. In your opinion, which has more intrinsic moral value? And by saying that, I mean, which one would you lean towards saving? Because in my opinion, if I can give that to you, go for it. I'm applying the golden rule to each chimp individually. And thus, if I was that chimp, all 100 of them in that boat, that in my mind is of more intrinsic moral importance than the one person. But that's just a figures thing so the main reason why i feel that way is that the weight of a hundred lives regardless of if they're chimp lives is a lot greater than the weight of the one person who is in the boat but that's just my opinion yeah yeah and uh i'll ask you what i asked before where if you're using like golden rule and you're applying golden rule, rule to each one of the 100 chimps, wouldn't that also work for, like, 100 mice, for example? Like, you would have to apply that to each one of the 100 mice, and then 100 is bigger than 1, 
even if the one applies to a human, so. Yes, and the only thing that I can say to you is that I'm gonna draw myself a loophole and say that mice have a gestation period that is a lot shorter than a chimpanzee's, so in the grand ultimate scheme of the universe, those hundred mice lives are gonna be reproduced fast enough for it to be of less moral importance. But clearly, the person means more to you than the hundred chimps. So why don't you tell me why? I think it, I think it's straight bias. Just okay. like species, like speciesism, like, uh, just like I can't help it, you know. Just like emotionally, it's hard to say that like I would save a hundred chimps over a person. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think. There is a good argument to say that, like, maybe it would be the right answer to choose the the chimps. And even for myself, with that bias, I think if you kept adding chimps, eventually it would be, like, a, it would overweigh the, the one person. Like, maybe, for example, like, if it... I think definitely if it was all chimps, like if chimps would get become extinct from my decision, then I think I would have to do ch- like choose the chimps. Right, right. But maybe I could go as far to say like if it was enough chimps to make them an endangered species, then maybe I think I would have to choose the chimps. Okay. And that concludes the debate hour. Now back to the episode. But yeah, but our answers definitely are not, uh, or they're definitely controversial, right? Like some people might be hearing this and like thinking it's ridiculous. Like how could you ever choose animal lives over a human life? No matter what kind of human life, no matter if they're like intellectually disabled or whatever. So we posit or singer posits and we stand yes facts the principle of minimal consideration which is pretty much okay animals non-human animals are not worthy of equal consideration but they're they're worthy of at least some consideration like minimal consideration Mm -hmm. enough so that like like excessive cruelty animal cruelty is is not good right like we shouldn't especially for trivial trivial benefits yeah yeah at at the very least we shouldn't like torture or inflict great harm to non-human animals just like uh like for dog fighting for like for the entertainment of people you know exactly so while you may not hold that they have equal value to a human life with the principle of minimal consideration you need to think about these trivial benefits that you're getting so you need to weigh the value of the product that you decide to choose and the value of a vegan alternative in terms of taste in terms of cost and in terms of convenience but according to singer there's a consensus among nutritionists that planned vegan diets are at least as healthy and vegan diets can actually be extremely tasty. I can't say that because I'm not a vegan. So how about we ask the frickin' vegan? <laughs> it's true. It's true! <laughs> <laughs> vegan alternatives can be quite tasty. And even if they're not like 100% as tasty, I think some of them are, but... Let's assume, like, the most they can get is, like, 70% as tasty as the real thing, right? right? Is that loss of 30%, like, taste points really worth putting animals through, like, utter torture that they go through in factory farms? Mm -hmm. I think that is something that is very important to think about. Right. Because it's, like... While I get, like, extreme amounts of pleasure from biting into a succulent steak. Trigger warning, succulent steak. Um, 
is that versus having a Greek salad with tofu as my protein instead of a succulent steak really that much of a benefit to the point where I can justify not only killing an animal, but bringing it up in an almost unlivable environment, if not an unlivable environment, just to have its life taken from it. And this is just a small point. Somebody may argue that these factory farmed animals, um, they're only exist, they only exist to produce meat. They wouldn't have any values if we hadn't bred them to produce more meat. And I say, as soon as they come spiraling out of that womb, they have whatever right they want. And I can tell you, it's not to be on our plates. So, yeah, that's just my two cents. You should stop me before I start rambling. <laughs> no, I like that. I like that. Another uh, argument against veganism, the adoption of it, is, well, I think it's more of an excuse, but people say that veganism or vegan diets are more expensive. And I do see that, like, a lot of vegan alternatives, like fake meat uh, specifically, are more expensive than the real things. But... That being said, you don't need to get those kinds of alternatives to be on a vegan diet. Correct. They're an option. Like, you can, you can be vegan for however long you want without ever buying Beyond Meat or any kind of fake meat. You don't have to buy vegan ice cream, you know? Mm-hmm. That's just, like, that's, a, that's just a choice. Like... Uh, as long as you're not eating products that come from animals which still leaves like a lot of foods a lot of vegetables uh, left over Mm -hmm. then you're good so before I make this statement I need you to look this up because if I do uh, I'll swipe the screen can you look up if falafel has any um meat product in it because I'm trying to bless these people with falafel falafel is insane because I'm pretty sure it's just potatoes chickpeas and a bunch of spices okay it says here is falafel vegan yes (laughs) Falafel is considered vegan by almost any definition, as these tasty fried chickpea balls are entirely plant-based. Let's go. Okay, so, nobody is saying that you have to have tofu for every meal. Nobody is, because, well, that'll hurt your pocket, but it also hurts your stomach. Um, You have a bunch of options. Like, obviously, you don't have to have fried chickpeas for every meal. But you can make falafel at home. You can find Mediterranean people to teach you how to do it properly. Quote unquote properly. I I don't know why I said that. To teach you how to make it. And being able to produce these type of things at home, I would argue, it gives you value. Because you care about the food that you're putting into yourself. You care about the ethics behind what you're feeding yourself. And if you give yourself enough options, which I argue everybody loves to a certain extent, then it's really easy to navigate. Not really easy. Nothing is really easy. It's functional to navigate this vegan lifestyle and adjust it to your circumstances. In my opinion, if I ever became vegan, I would have to do more research first on the ethics around it. But like, I I love cheese, man. I don't know if I could give up cheese. And in my mind, nobody dies for cheese. So I got to educate myself first. But that's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Do should I talk about cheese a little bit? Do you want to talk about cheese? You want to educate us on about cheese, bro? Uh, (laughs) sure. Yeah. Yeah, just real quick. Like, 
uh, the thing with cheese uh, and dairy products is uh, there's still a lot of animal suffering that goes into producing them. Like cheese comes from milk, right? Right. And then milk comes from uh, mother cows, right? And like a lot of people <laughs> might not know this, which is kind of surprising, but uh, cows like make milk for the exact same reasons as humans make milk. It's like when it's after they give birth and they need to feed their baby with their milk, right? Mm -hmm. So in order for a cow in the industry, wherever, to produce milk, they need to be like inseminated. And then this happens forcefully, like uh, right. through the farmers. Like they have to like forcefully impregnate her. Right. So that she becomes a mother so that she produces milk, right? Right. Uh, yeah, and then from there, things happen, like, uh, the calf needs to be, like, taken away mm -hmm. immediately, and since, like, evolutionarily, just like with humans, there's just, like, uh, the mother and the calf can't help but to, like, want to bond with each other, like, have this strong bond. Right. They feel that, and, like, they can feel, like, uh, uh, distress for, like, multiple days. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, yeah, I mean... So, while there is not a loss of life, there's psychological traumas that come with the milk and dairy process. So, like I said, I had to educate myself more, but the root of that statement, you, you obviously have something else to say, so go ahead as soon as I'm done. Um, yeah, yeah. The root of that statement I was just trying to say is that you don't need to be a militant vegan, quote unquote, militant vegan, adjust the lifestyle to fit you. Because as Sonny and I established earlier, we are black and white when it comes to our differences, night and day when it comes to our differences. So not everybody is going to have the exact same values when it comes to a lifestyle like this. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add real quick, uh, in terms of loss of life, uh, it's almost guaranteed that that dairy cow is going to be sent to the slaughterhouse and used for meat anyway, so. <laughs> yeah. But wow. not to leave it hanging on that too much, just to go back to our points, our main points, with uh, taste, cost, and convenience. If you are losing out a little bit, maybe 30 taste points of taste, and maybe if you are losing out on a bit of cost and convenience, even though I feel that there are ways to have a vegan diet, not have it as costly or inconvenient, or if you do lose out on those aspects, do you really lose out so much that it justifies you supporting uh, the torture and great amount of suffering that animals go through in factory farms. Mm -hmm.